Matilda. Yes, I, I really don't want to be very formal into this, but I can't uh, avoid coming back to the convention uh, on people with disability uh, in all the comments that are made here. For example, I go to Article 8 of the convention when talking about uh, stigma, stereotype, uh, and it, uh, that article deals uh, absolutely with the issue of a change of culture. It, it's a, a change of appro approach, a change of paradigm, what you need. Uh, and is of course a double discrimination what we are talking about and, and I, I agree with Nora in many cases as with women is triple discrimination but in a sense in article 23 for example there is another uh, issue that deals with research uh, so it's just uh, I think we have to recognize that this convention can give a, a, a big umbrella to the synergies in, in the field and in action dealing with uh, AIDS and disability. Washington. Are facing triple stigma, triple discrimination, first as a woman coming from the African context, secondly you are a woman with a disability, and third you are having HIV and AIDS. So it's like triple stigma. Because uh, most of the clients who've reported at Liverpool VCT for counseling and testing, they reported to us that uh, I've come because a neighbor, my husband died and the neighbor took over, inherited me, and I'm also just feeling I may be at risk of maybe the spouse had passed away because of HIV and now I've been infected. So some cultures even force like wife inheritance and deaf clans have been reporting that they are facing that violence in within even the family setup. And uh, sometimes we are aware that there is no real information that has been there about issues of disability around the world. Sometimes most of the women dis with disabilities face the discrimination in that nobody is willing to have accessible information on sexual violence that is in a more accessible way to the blind, to the deaf, like, for instance, in Liverpool VCT, we have a care and treatment center where most of the clients were reporting that uh, when we present for maybe a post-exposure prophylaxis after facing sexual violence, healthcare providers give us drugs without even exploring what have we presented for. So how sure can we be that we are being treated for the right infection? So it's very, very, very challenging for the women with disabilities. Washington, I, I want to go one step further with this because we're, we're, we're focusing a lot and understandably on the stigmas around disability within the AIDS workers and the healthcare workers. But if we're going to co really confront this from both sides, we have to look at the difficult parts of both sides of this relationship. So what are the stigmas within the disability community about HIV AIDS that you see in your constituency and that you have to struggle with as you try to help them make the connections. Thank you, Avi. Not only are we facing a stigma in within the health setting, but again, in within the disability community again. It's not easy for a person with a disability to disclose his or her status, even to any person, because the environment, the safe space that we are looking for, it may not be safe for us to be able to disclose our status. The support system in within the disability community is very minimal to be able to just give us that safe space. For me as a deaf person to disclose my status, I'm worried. What is the perception of my deaf colleagues? Will they stop interacting with me? As a blind woman, will the other blind women start gossiping about me? So it's very challenging even in within the deaf society. Like a deaf person, my experience I, as a deaf person, when I'm going for those services, I already have like a perception. There's an attitude towards me as a deaf person. So we believe as much as we are building the capacity of the service providers to really change their perception towards people with disabilities. Again, we as people with disabilities, we have like our own stereotypes, our own perceptions that the service providers are not going to be friendly. They are not going to give us the services. So again, as people with disabilities, 
we need again to really like really take the courage, take a step and move forward to also come out of our world. And also in within the disability program, another challenge is in within the disability movement, we are also having like our own politics around, making it very complex again, even for us to like move forward. In within the disabled people's organization, we have our own politics and which has really made it a very great challenge for us to have a breakthrough. When you talk about the politics within the disability community, it makes me want to bring Steve Esty into the conversation. <laughs> um, what can you tell us about, because you've been one of the pioneers in making this link from within Disabled People International and, and, and in the rest of your work. What have you confronted in breaking out of the disability paradigm and into this connection that can help us see a way, a way forward? I'll hold the mic. The challenges that we face in making the paradigm shift, our community of people with disabilities has so many challenges. We face so many issues that there's a constant struggle in the community for things to, to address all of the different issues which we face. And as Washington was saying, there are an awful lot of barriers that are, that are in their community and concerns about what other members of the community might say and things. And we also struggle as a disability community to get um, to get visibility on, on many, many fronts. And this issue of AIDS and disability is something that the AIDS community hasn't talked about in the 17 meeting that they've had, and we're just waking up to it ourselves. And I think, really, we're waking up to it ourselves probably very much because of the opportunities that are happening around the new UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. We're seeing a responsiveness and a receptivity around AIDS issues within the UN system. So it seems like an opportune time to, to make that jump, to make that paradigm shift, and to get this issue out in front. But it, we're just at the very beginning stages of it, so we need to work together with the AIDS community. I suspect that the place might be full of people in the AIDS community tonight. So I want to start bringing the audience in more with, with this challenge. We're hearing from the disability side of struggles to overcome barriers within that community to address HIV AIDS in all of its complexity. Maybe it's time for a little uh, shared angst so that we can get some of the barriers from within the world of HIV and AIDS towards disability on the table as you as a, as a collective start to grapple with this issue. What are, the, what are the barriers within the world of HIV AIDS activism and organizations and institutions that are making, forgive me, such a blind spot of, of, this, of 650 million human beings? Who in the audience is ready to start taking this on? Don't be shy. Someone will go first, and then it'll get easier. Someone at the back. Always someone sitting right underneath the light is the most courageous. I'll hold the mic. Don't worry. You just talk. Actually, introduce yourself first. OK. My name is Yesu Sawit. I'm a physician from Ethiopia. And I'm a big fan of Yetnabash, so that's why I'm here. But I'm really It's a Yetnabash fan club. I guess we're all members of that now. Okay. I'm really ashamed to be here because practicing HIV medicine for 15 years and teaching a lot of medical professionals, counselors, and so on about counseling and so on. This is the first, I'm here because yes, Nabash is here. I, I never thought about issues around disability with HIV. So when we train our health workers, when we train our counselors, I mean, I mean, Ethiopia, I mean, most of the services are very much backward, but we never thought of having a sign language interpreter in the hospital. So the awareness is not there. It's zero. So I think that's, that's the biggest issue. So now I'm listening to all these people here. And then I, uh, what I'm listening to is, again, I, because I'm a big fan, I would like to quote Yet Nebber, is that she said, why do you focus on disabilities? Why don't you focus on abilities? So this is, I think, a very famous saying of hers. So I'm thinking of, I mean, my head is now buzzing. So I'm thinking of how to introduce issues in our curriculums, in, even in the short trainings that we do. That, I mean, there are disabled people. 
who can be HIV infected? I, I've, I mean, this has never entered into my mind and I'm ashamed to say that in public. So I think the biggest issue is that we're not aware, we, we're ignorant about this topic. Well, I think as, as we talk more and people who have spent a long time thinking about this, we may be able to send you away with some concrete things. But share a little bit more of the buzzing in your head. What are you going to do with this recognition when you go home? And then you'll get some suggestions from your colleagues and have more concrete things. But what can you do concretely in your practice? I think very small things, like small, small things, like making the community aware. I mean, there are thousands of trainings occurring in every country about the issue, about HIV. So bringing like a few PowerPoints about disability as one of the challenges in HIV, it's, I mean, practice. And then some physical things like having the ramps. I can tell you that none of our HIV clinics, I know about 100 something HIV clinics in Ethiopia, none of them have a wheelchair ramp. And I have a lot of patients, for example, who are disabled because of HIV, in fact. A ramp is also a statement. When you put a ramp somewhere, people start wondering why there's a ramp there. And if you need, anyone needs a ramp in Mexico City, first of all, we've got two that we're giving away at the end of the session. And we now know where to get them made relatively cheaply. Are you done or you have more to say? So this is some of the buzzing, so. Thank you for sharing your buzzings. Who's next? Introduce yourself first. I'll hold the mic. Thank you. My name is Rosangela Berman Biller. I'm with the Inter American Institute on Disability and Inclusive Development. We have been working with uh, HIV AIDS and disability in the LAC region for five years, coordinating actions with the uh, seven national HIV AIDS programs in the region, trying to mainstream it in public policy. We are here in Mexico. We had the third technical meeting, having people from the, the national programs, and we started with the whole prevention approach, and now we are getting into the attention, as in Brazil, for example, Brazil is one of the programs working with us, uh, they are verifying after having people living with AIDS for 10 years, that people are acquiring disabilities because of the medication, and it means that this is not only a topic that is interested and important for this group of the 10% of the population. We are talking about uh, disability as being part of the, the cycle, the life cycle of everybody else. And people living with AIDS is feeling discriminated inside of their own communities. And disability is a topic today that it's part of all the discussions and should be brought to the public policies, not only to isolated initiatives from the disability community or one or another group. We are working with seven national programs and all of them are really including in their agendas. We have in the websites already implementation suggestions, uh, uh, matrices of many recommendations, and as Nora was saying, that's not rocket science at all. We know how to do, it's easy thing, we just have to break the cycle of invisibility and exclusion because the human being is uh, very excluded and we tend to exclude and the AIDS community does the same with the disability area. You know we, we've raised something here that also has also come up I think at this conference and will come up more. In the disability world it's always been about pre-existing disabilities. In the HIV AIDS world, it's about disabilities as a consequence of living with the virus. So I think that there's something a little fragile about this because there are different lenses completely. I wonder if there's an opportunity in the, in the HIV AIDS world to, to see as more and more people become disabled because of the disease, um, whether that might be a bridge or whether the AIDS world can only see right now disability in terms of consequences of the, vi of the virus, and actually those could be blinders. Nora, I know you've done some thinking about this. Actually, there's a tremendous bridge that could be built. People who have worked in the disability rights community and disability advocacy know a lot about living with a disability. And instead of reinventing the wheel in the AIDS community by the, with the kind of people who are becoming disabled as a consequence of AIDS, learning to live with a disability, the people who are already disabled in the communities they live in and the organizations of disabled people could be tremendous allies in working 
uh, in terms of living with a disability, local transportation, laws, uh, support systems, how, how to live on a day-to-day -day basis. They already know how to live with a disability. Instead of having to, to reinvent all of this, the information is there. And that could be a common ground to begin a very fruitful discourse with the, with the AIDS community. Yeah, Nimersh, go ahead. Thank you, Avi. I, I just feel that the way that uh, Professor Nora stated it, uh, like the issue of being an ally for the AIDS uh, community is that, I mean, why, why are all of you here in the AIDS conference? Is it because all of you have HIV yet? I mean, that's not the issue, yeah. And, and I think that I mean, because it's our threat. For those who have already got HIV positive, it's already their life. They have already got it in some instances. And for those of us who didn't get it, it's our threat. The same applies to disability. For those who are present with disabilities, it's our life. For those of you who didn't get disability, I'm not threatening you, but it's your threat. Rachel? Yeah, I just wanted to emphasize uh, the need of not inventing another wheel, because the wheel is already there. Like, the, uh, like in Southern Africa Federation of the Disabled, we have a research program uh, which is being funded by DFID, and we have five priority areas which we want to research on. And one of the top five priority areas is the area of HIV and AIDS and disability. And we are doing that research in the Southern African countries. So I'm, I'll just uh, call upon all the interested parties if you want to work with us, there is already a project which is going on in Southern Africa, which you can partner with us to make sure that we, we work on this area of HIV and AIDS. And at the same time, as Africa, as a continent, we have also a, an Africa campaign on HIV and AIDS, of which there are so many programs that we want to, to see so that we in, uh, include disability and HIV and AIDS. So as I've already said that there's no need to invent another wheel. So you can just partner with us in these uh, programs, Africa Campaign on HIV and even the program on research which is being funded by DFID. You are welcome to work with us in this event. Thank you. Washington, I want you to, I want you to address this too and then Nora can give us a bigger context. You referred earlier to a lack of research inhibiting your ability to raise money from funders, specifically for your project, which is a groundbreaking and visionary and important project. Tell us a little bit more about the intersection between research and fundraising and, and how you experience that. Uh, indeed, our program, we are facing lack of research to just be able to give us like evidence to fundraise. Because uh, most of the times, we've gone into round table negotiations with uh, agencies that are providing funding to the AIDS community. We've gone to roundtable discussions with governments, and most of the time, different countries. We've found it very hard to even convince agencies to just see that it is real, it is real, HIV is, is affecting people with disabilities. Hence, it's become a challenge to us. And they really demand for evidence. Agencies are telling us, give us the evidence, give us case studies. For instance, when we've been trying to fundraise for the inclusion of people with disabilities, I think the AIDS community looks at us with many assumptions, as my colleagues have said. People implement things for us on assumptions, and this has again challenged us in really resource mobilization. And for us to implement these programs, we need again resources from the same AIDS community. Fund us for us to have evidence-based programs. If you fund us, we promise you we're gonna give you the evidence. We are hopeful, even from this forum, we are going to link up with most of you to fundraise just for that evidence before you demand it from us.